Bum 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 Stop, collaborate and listen. Maybe that's an intro? Yeah. Hi, I'm Grant and welcome to the ninth class in the meteorology series all about icing. Ice adds a lot of weight to the aircraft that we then have to lift through the air with us. It also changes the shape of aerodynamic surfaces leading to disruption in the airflow. Previously, I've done a class called Contamination in the Principles of Flight series, which can add a bit more information to this video should you need it to help build a nice picture of why icing is such a big problem for aircraft. Airframe icing can occur whenever an aircraft flies through liquid water at temperatures below zero degrees Celsius, or if it flies through precipitation that falls onto a cold below zero degrees Celsius airframe and it forms ice on contact. There are a few types of airframe icing caused by slightly different conditions. The first one is hoar frost. This happens when water vapor in the air sublimates directly to ice on the surface of the aircraft. This is the kind of frost you would get on your car overnight and you have to defrost your car in the morning. It can occur in flight when flying from an area of cold air, which has cooled the airframe, into an area of warmer, higher humidity air. And that means that the saturation water vapor pressure reduces near the cold airframe and the water vapor sublimates directly out onto the airframe in the form of hoar frost. Second type of icing is known as rime ice. It is formed when small, supercooled water droplets come into contact with the airframe. The impurity of the aircraft and the airframe gives something for the ice crystals to form around. This ice forms almost instantaneously on the leading edges of the airframe and the rapid freezing process leads to air bubbles being trapped within the ice structure itself. And this means that rime ice is quite brittle and easy to get rid of using de-icing systems. This type of icing is typical within clouds themselves as the suspended water droplets are still small as they have not yet grown large enough to fall as precipitation. Also, it will be common in more stratiform clouds because the lower levels of rising air means that the water droplets are smaller. Clear ice is rime ice's older brother. It is formed when large supercooled water droplets come into contact with the airframe rather than small supercooled water droplets. Because the droplets are larger, they take a bit longer to freeze. So when the aircraft gives something for the ice crust to form around, they begin to freeze but keep flowing backwards over the length of the wing due to the airflow. And they slowly freeze as they go. This slow freezing process means that there are a lot fewer air pockets and mean that clear ice is, has a much more uniform structure and it covers a large area as it's slowly freezing and it's working its way back. This means that it's heavier and harder to get rid of and as this type of ice is formed by large supercooled water droplets, in, it's more common in clouds with higher levels of rising air and therefore bigger droplets, such as cumuliform clouds or cumulonimbus clouds, for example. You could also encounter a mixture of both small and large supercooled water droplets um, when you're in one cloud and then, then you would have a mixture of rime, ice and clear ice. So why is icing even an issue then? Firstly, the ice that forms on the airframe will add weight to the aircraft. So normally an aircraft is in perfect balance if it's flying straight and level, the weight and the lift are equal to each other. And therefore, if we add a bit more weight in the form of ice, we then don't have enough lift to balance out this um, added weight. So we're therefore gonna have to produce more lift in order to counteract this increase in weight. If the aircraft is already carrying up to close of its maximum load, then it might not be able to maintain flight if the ice buildup gets too uh, extreme. So it just simply can't produce the correct amount of lift for this added weight. The second problem with icing kind of adds to this problem. So the ice on the aerodynamic surfaces, mainly the wing, 
will change the shape of them. It'll make them more rough at the surface. What this means in practice is you get a reduction in lift and an increase in weight, which is not a very good combo because you want to be increasing your lift because you've got more weight. In terms of engine icing, there's two main forms. You get carburetor and intake icing. So in a piston engine, a device called a carburetor sucks in air to the engine using a venturi tube. And inside the venturi, fuel is added in vapor form, and this fuel vaporization causes a drop in temperature. This sudden drop in temperature can cause ice to form and freeze to the walls of the venturi tube, as long as the amount of water in the air is high enough, as long as there's enough water vapor in the air. The temperature doesn't necessarily have to be low for this to happen, as the fuel vaporization can cause a temperature drop of around 20 degrees. So if you're at 15 degrees Celsius, you drop by 20, you're obviously below freezing at that point, but it's gonna be more obvious and more of a problem when the temperature is already cold. So this ice that forms in the inside of the venturi tube restricts the amount of air that is able to flow through it, and it will lead to an incorrect ratio of fuel to air going to the engine. Normally what happens is the mixture sent to the engine will be too rich in fuel and the ignition of the fuel will be worse because it's not got enough oxygen to burn. This will lead to less power output from the engine and a similar thing can happen if we go upstream of the carburetor. If you think about the vents that are actually allowing the air in, if they become restricted with ice, less air can flow in and leads to problems downstream with the mixture and a reduction in power as well. So that's a form of intake icing, and you also get intake icing on jet engines. So jet engines have large intakes where the airframe icing occurs, and it restricts the hole that the air can get to the engine, basically. Um, it's the same sort of thing that's happening on the intakes of the piston engine. You're just not allowing a big enough space for the air to flow in, and it means that downstream in the combustion chamber, um, you've got too much fuel, not enough oxygen, a less good burn, a less good explosion in the engine basically, and a reduction in power because of that. So icing conditions occur whenever we are below 10 degrees Celsius and there's visible moisture in the air. 10 degrees Celsius is obviously not below freezing point, but when we are moving through the air, the wind on the aircraft can basically cool it down significantly. And if it reaches below freezing, then air moisture can freeze onto the surface of the aircraft or the engine intakes. When we are below zero degrees Celsius until about minus 20 degrees Celsius, then we are in the band to basically experience large and small supercooled water droplets in clouds and therefore we're gonna encounter both rime and clear icing. When we go slightly colder and we look between minus 20 and minus 40, there is more chance for there to be smaller supercooled water droplets. This is because large water droplets, whilst freezing slower and more gradually, tend to form ice at a warmer temperature than the small water droplets. So as it gets colder, there's a larger proportion of small supercooled water droplets than there is large supercooled water droplets, which means we're more likely to experience rime ice. When we're at temperatures below 40 degrees Celsius, most of these supercooled water droplets will have frozen into solid ice. And we would consider it very unlikely for the ice particles to stick to the aircraft. And we'd say that we are no longer within icing conditions below 40 degrees Celsius. So when we're flying around, we would switch on the anti-icing whenever we enter clouds and the temperature is 10 degrees or lower up until we reach about minus 40 and then we can switch the anti-icing back off. To summarize then, you've got three main types of icing. You've got hoar frost, you've got rime ice and you've got clear ice. Hoar frost is when the water vapor in the air sublimates directly on into ice um, on the surface of the aircraft. It's very thin very easy to get rid of. It's the kind of ice you get on your windscreen of your car after a cold night. Rime ice is formed when small supercooled water droplets freeze 
instantaneously on the leading edges of the airframe. And because this freezing process takes place so quickly, it leads to a lot of uh, impurities in the ice, a lot of air bubbles, air pockets, and therefore rime ice is quite brittle and easy to get rid of. Clear ice is formed when larger supercooled water droplets freeze on the surface and the leading edges of the aircraft. And because they're larger, they freeze a bit slower and they have time to spread out over the length of the airframe. And it's a lot more pure in its form, a lot fewer air bubbles, and therefore it's heavier and harder to get rid of. The issues with icing mainly come from adding weight, which then needs to be balanced out by more lift. And if you're close to your maximum amount of uh, your maximum load, if you're close to your maximum takeoff weight or landing weight, for instance, then you might not have enough um, aerodynamic lift to counteract this added weight. And that problem is enhanced by the fact that the ice forming on the wings and any aerodynamic surfaces such as the tail or the fin will change the shape of the surface. And that means that the airflow doesn't flow in its predicted pattern and it disrupts the formation of these forces and leads to, in practice, a loss of lift, which you add to your increase in weight. So you're getting even smaller amount of lift and a larger amount of weight um, which adds to the problem. In terms of engine icing, you get carburetor icing or engine intake icing. Carburetor icing is formed by the fuel injection into the carburetor causing a reduction in temperature. It doesn't necessarily have to be below zero degrees for this to happen, but when it's below zero degrees, it's easier for this to happen. And what happens is the venturi tube that is being used to suck, engine, suck air into the engine becomes restricted and it means that there's less air flowing um, with a larger proportion being fuel. That means there's less oxygen to help with the burn and the explosion in the pistons. So you get less power output. And the same sort of thing is happening with engine intake icing. So normally you've got a big disc of air coming in. When you've got icing, you're restricting the amount of air that can flow in and it means that there's less oxygen in the fuel to air mixture to burn, to explode in the engine and to create that power. So you get a reduction in power if you've got either carburetor icing or engine intake icing. Icing conditions, we would consider anything below 10 degrees Celsius with moisture in the air, uh, with visible moisture in the air, so basically clouds or precipitation. And when you're between zero and minus 20, you're likely to get both large and small supercooled water droplets so you're getting both uh, clear ice and rime ice, large and small supercooled water droplets. When you're between minus 20 and minus 40, you're far more likely to get rime ice because the clear, um, the large supercooled water droplets have already frozen into solid particles by the time we get to these temperatures. And you're more likely to get the small ones and therefore more likely to get rime ice. And then when we're temperatures below minus 40, um, even the rime ice will have frozen into solid particles and it's very unlikely for these solid ice particles to stick to the aircraft and therefore you would be considered as no longer being in icing conditions. So you'd switch your anti-icing on at 10 degrees and you could switch it back off again if you get colder than minus 40.